Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are increasingly forming an authoritarian alliance. What unites them? Mutual animosity towards the United States. Vladimir Putin said as much in his opening remarks at their meeting in Uzbekistan, saying the US is trying to create a unipolar world that must be opposed. The foreign policy tandem between Moscow and Beijing plays a key role in ensuring global and regional stability. He lashed the United States for what he called provocative behaviour in the Taiwan Strait and said Russia firmly backs China on that issue. For our part, we stand firm on the one China principle. We condemn provocations of the US and its satellites in the Taiwan Strait. On Ukraine, Mr Putin thanked Xi Jinping for what he called China's balanced position on the conflict. China has been very supportive of Russia, dramatically increasing its trade volume in an effort to offset Western sanctions. Beijing too has been happy to entertain Russia's claim that NATO expansion cornered Russia into a position where Vladimir Putin had little choice but to invade his neighbour. China and Russia have maintained effective strategic communication. In the face of changes in the world, China is willing to work with Russia to demonstrate the responsibility of a major country, play a leading role and inject stability into a turbulent world. But China has stopped short of fully endorsing the war and there were hints of disagreement with Mr Putin telling Xi Jinping he understands the Chinese leader has some questions and concerns. Whether anything more tangible comes of this meeting in the coming days will be worth watching. But it's also worth noting on Friday, Vladimir Putin will meet India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Mr Modi too has been unwilling to condemn the war in Ukraine. So for Vladimir Putin, this is a huge boost to have the leaders of the world's two most populous countries meeting him face to face. And it's a message to the West that all that condemnation about what he's doing in Ukraine is not universal. Bill Bertels reporting there and Paul Dibb is an emeritus professor with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at ANU in Canberra and he joins us now. Paul Dibb, welcome. So what does this meeting signify about the status of the relationship between the Russians and the Chinese? It continues on. Let's make it very clear, although I describe the relationship as a quasi alliance, it's not like the NATO alliance, you know, there's no Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. But some people are underestimating the importance of this relationship. And we need to remember that these, the leaders of these two powers are increasingly close on military matters. It is true, as you've just said, that Xi Jinping is not endlessly endorsing um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He's asked some questions and matters of concern. But you know, when these two powers uh, last year had a rendezvous of four strategic nuclear capable bombers practicing cruise missile release over Guam. When we've had them uh, together in a joint force of 10 each major surface combatants and submarines encircling the islands of Japan, people who are commentators, particularly in London, don't see the importance to us of those particular issues. And as you mentioned there, Xi Jinping apparently had questions and concerns about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Where does the Chinese position on that stand now? Well, Xi Jinping is making it very clear, echoing Putin, uh, and that is that this um, limited military operation, so-called, is the fault of NATO and the West for encircling Russia and banging up against its borders. Um, and that's an important endorsement by Xi Jinping. We don't expect him to send troops, nothing of that sort. And naturally, because he's the world's greatest um, trading power, unlike Russia, Xi Jinping has been careful not to challenge or break the worst sanctions against Russia. So, you know, he's walking a bit of a tightrope. Um, but I expect, as I say, in military and other terms, this relationship to continue. And that is relevant to our strategic position in East Asia. And Vladimir Putin in his opening remarks talked about advocating for a more fair and reasonable international order. What are the implications of this for the US, Europe and their allies, including Australia? Well, we're on the edge now of a serious collision between the United States and NATO Europe and Russia. I don't want to exaggerate, but 
It remains to be seen how this war, which is the biggest conventional military war we've seen in Europe since the end of World War II. The Americans have been careful not to have troops or demonstrable presence on the ground in Ukraine, although we are, we do know that they are supporting uh, Ukraine in very important and crucial uh, information, not just on intelligence and targeting, but on advanced weapons. The question is, when will Putin decide he has to expand this war and, for instance, interdict and attack the resupply by NATO countries through Poland of advanced or more advanced uh, military weapons. And you've heard Putin repeatedly in recent weeks and months talk about nuclear weapons. And let's remember, this is a power that still has four and a half thousand strategic nuclear weapons. He talks about tactical nuclear weapons, which in my view is a nonsense. There's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. If he uses, it, uses one, which I think there is a risk he might, then the game is on. And is he being backed into a bit of a corner in recent weeks with the significant Russian losses of territory in eastern Ukraine and reports of murmurings in Moscow about uh, well, people with concerns about how the operation is going? Well, that's an excellent question. And I think the answer to your question is yes. Um, right from the very beginning, when I believed, and so did, by the way, the United States Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff before the invasion, that the Russians would be in Kiev in two to three days. We were wrong on that. We were wrong on just how terrible um, this Russian military performance is, how inadequate. And now we have the situation in Nikrakiv, um, where Russians are dropping their weapons and fleeing, apparently. Now, you know, we'll have to wait and see whether now Putin digs his heels in further and as I've implied, starts to use some either more advanced weapons and or targets NATO resupply through Warsaw. But the loss of face for Putin is very substantial. Having said that, the most recent sort of dependable opinion poll, Levada, has shown that 76% of Russians support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and we have to remember, too, that there's, there is no likelihood, in my view, and I hope I'm wrong, of Putin being overthrown as leader. We'll have to wait and see. But there's no doubt he's losing face, and face matters crucially to a one-man band, a quasi-dictator such as Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. And when he gets cornered, then the risk is how much further, in an unpredictable way, might this military conflict go. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul Dib, really good to get your perspective. Thanks for talking to us this morning from Canberra.